Hello, welcome to the Thursday, June 28th, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Remember about a week ago, I talked to Mark Lucas, the STI student who wrote a paper about Office 365 logs. Now, he explained how there are actually quite detailed logs available, but a lot of this you have to enable. And of course, it's too late to enable it after an incident. Well, it turns out that in addition to these official logs that Microsoft actually always had some private APIs that could be used to gather some fairly detailed data about Office 365 activity. This particular API was fairly tightly held up to now. We have now a couple great blog posts by CrowdStrike and by Sherry Davidoff about how to actually analyze this. And Sherry's team actually did release a tool that makes it relatively easy to extract these logs. So we're not talking about a vulnerability here. These logs, they require authentication, everything, but these are APIs that were not available or at least not made public before. And only a couple forensics teams actually knew about the existence of these APIs and sort of treated them as a trade secret. Now, one particular type of case where this comes in really handy is phishing. And this is something that Office 365 users fall for all the time given that there are still organizations out there that do not enforce two-factor authentication for these kind of cloud services. So typically, if your account gets breached, the attacker will then try to launch a business email compromise, which usually involves them searching for emails that relate to invoices, for example. And of course, they will log in and uh, send email or read email to do this. These activity logs, they do log mailbox searches, for example. They also log logons and they also do detect and log if an email is being read. So this could potentially, as Sherry points out in her blog, save you a lot of money if you can prove that after the attacker log in to the system that they actually didn't read that many emails. So you don't have to notify all customers that send email to this particular individual but only the ones whose email was actually read. I'll link in the show notes to Sherry's blog. And with that, you'll also have links then to her magic unicorn tool, which allows you to read these logs, as well as links to other blog posts from her blog that include more details about how these logs work. And talking about secrets that are no more secret, well, you probably heard years ago about these secret yellow dots that printers add to documents. These dots usually encode the serial number of the printer and may also encode, for example, the time and date when a particular document was printed. These dots have heavily been used by law enforcement and others in order, for example, to uncover leaks. Now, while all of this is pretty well known, what's new is that a couple of researchers in Germany came up with an app that will not only decode these yellow dots, but this app will also allow you to essentially anonymize your documents again by adding additional yellow dots to the printout that will render the pattern useless. So interesting little app and certainly something that you should look into if you're concerned about privacy. And well, talking about staying anonymous, this may of course be in particular important if you're working on a malware investigation. And one of the standard things to do if you detect malware in your environment is to look up that document hash on VirusTotal or even to upload the suspect malware. The problem with this, of course, is that now the attacker may be able to see that their particular sample was either uploaded to VirusTotal or even that the particular hash was checked against VirusTotal. 
So Renato today wrote a diary with a couple of other approaches to search for malware and to figure out if any similar malware was uploaded to common malware repositories. The trick here is that you don't use any of the hashes like SHA-256 or SHA-2, SHA-1, MD5 that you would use to specifically identify a particular sample. Instead, there are other hashing algorithms that distinguish themselves by actually producing similar hashes for similar binaries. Not only does this have the advantage that they don't necessarily identify a particular sample, instead they're really looking more for common patterns, common libraries and common code segments, which can be quite useful. In Renato's particular case, the sample that he found that looked initially like it was a new unique sample actually turned out to be a variant of WannaCry. So something well known, not necessarily targeted, but just unique because of some minor modifications that had been made, which of course lead to different hashes. And according to Bleeping Computer, attackers have started to exploit a Cisco vulnerability that was patched earlier in June. This particular vulnerability, CVE 2018-296, was described as a denial of service against the web admin interface of ASA devices by Cisco. However, it also allowed for data leakage by essentially giving the attacker access to various configuration parameters on the device. Exploits have been publicly available for about a week now, so no real surprise that exploitation has already been attempted against devices. So if you haven't done so yet, make sure you patch your ASA and Firepower devices if they are affected by this vulnerability. Well, that's it for today. And just as a heads up, a week from today on Wednesday, there will be the 4th of July holiday here in the United States. So probably I'll keep an abbreviated schedule for the podcast next week. Haven't quite decided yet uh, what days I'll record it and not. I'll make it a little bit dependent on whether or not there is sufficient news to talk about, but probably we'll have one on Monday and Tuesday, and then probably on Thursday again, maybe Friday. That's it, and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.